Hello and welcome to the Y Webinar 2 Introduction to the Milan R Package. My name is Mikkel Andersen, I'm from Denmark and this is joint work with David Balding who is uh, located in Melbourne, Australia. This is uh, talk number two in a series uh, of the forensic evaluation of Y profile evidence. We recommend that you are familiar with the contents of webinar number one, uh, and that describes a new approach for high mutation rate Y profiles. The new approach that David and I published in 2017 is based on estimating the number of males whose Y profile matches that of an alleged contributor. In this talk, we'll discuss the Milan software, and that software can be used to estimate the distribution of the number of matching males which we are interested in. And in fact, this software was developed as a part of our publication in 2017 and also the one in 2019. I will give uh, details on these publications in the very last slide of this talk. Uh, and also it, re it was used to present the, or to generate the results presented in talk number one. Milan stands for Male Lineage Analysis. It's open source uh, and it's developed as an R package, meaning that you need the R uh, statistical software first, and then you can install the Milan package using this install.packages Milan. As I mentioned, it is open source, so the entire source code is available on GitHub on this link that I provide here. So you're welcome to download it and modify it uh, in any way you see fit. There's online documentation and installation instructions available at this link. The output of the Milan software is mainly uh, numerical, uh, so there are no figures. Uh, the figures in this talk is uh, made by an, uh, an external function, and it's not a part of the Milan software, and I'll mention this again in, uh, in a few slides. The purpose of simulating populations is again to approximate the distribution of the number of males with a Y profile uh, matching that of, uh, of an observed profile. So Milan can simulate random genealogies and then add haplotypes according to certain rules. For example, we implement the population models described in talk number one, including variance in reproductive success. Again, we provide more details in our 2017 publication. Haplotypes are inherited from the father, it's, uh, it's the Y chromosome, and mutations happen independently at each locus. So in this slide, I show how to use the software. So first you, you type in library Milan, and that's to tell R that we want to use the function in this package. And again, you need to install the package first using this command. In this talk, I will use version 102 of Milan, and that's the one that is available on CRAN. So that's the version you will get if you put this one in um, here in July 2020. Then in this talk, I have set seed, and then I put in a seed. Here I put in one, but it can be um, any integer that you like. Uh, and I do that for rep reproducibility. So if I do this random simulations again, I'll get the same results if I had the same seed. So it is to be able to re re replicate the results, although they are random. So what I do first is to simulate a genealogy. And here I simulate one with a constant population size of 10 in all 10 generations. And I save the object in sim underscore res. So that's a simulation result. <clears throat> this uh, object contains several slots. One of them is the actual population so I access that with a dollar population, and I do that when I have to extract the pedigrees. So I, I have to build the pedigrees or extract them once I have simulated the genealogy. In this case, I, <coughs> I also plot the, the simulation result on the right-hand side. And for this specific simulation, I get two pedigrees. Um, and again, the plotting functionality here is external to the Milan software. What the Milan software does is to give each male a unique person ID, or what we refer to as PID. So for example, this number one here means that that is person ID number one. His father is has ID 11, and, 
and then Eleven has, except uh, beside number one, he also has Sun number five. So it is just to keep track of the individuals, so have an, have an identifier for the individuals. <clears throat> the default behavior is that only the ancestors of the males in the final generation, so generation number 10 here, are simulated. So there are 10 individuals in this last generation, and then the generation before, only the individuals that has ancestors in this final generations are uh, included and so on backwards in time. So here we get <coughs> two founders and thereby two pedigrees. If we had continue for several generations back in the past, we would get one uh, founder for these two and again only uh, end up with one pedigree in total. So the more generations you have, uh, the, the fewer pedigrees you would also expect to have. So <laughs> we can do it a bit more advanced, so we can introduce variance in reproductive success. And <clears throat> what we do is the same as before, but here we enable gamma, and that's the explanation here is a bit technical, but that's the way we implemented this variance in reproductive success. That's via a gamma distribution. So we enable gamma, and then we set the parameters for this gamma distribution. And again, we build the pedigrees. I have written a blog post on this VIS parameters. So <coughs> the, the link that the parameters here should be five to obtain a VRS value of 0.2 may seem a bit strange, but again, that is explained in this blog post. So please have a look in that blog post to have some more details on the um, connection between the VRS value and these parameters. Uh, once again, we only get two pedigrees in this small example. In general, uh, if you have larger VRS values, you would get more variance in the uh, pedigree size. We can then continue and then add haplotypes. And in this small example, I just add a two locus haplotype. So first I set the mutation rates for these loci. So I have two loci and I say that each of the loci has a mutation rate of 0.1, so 10%. So that's fairly high. Um, uh, and the mutation rate is per generation. I then call a function called pedigrees, all popular haplotypes. So I say I have my pedigrees object from before, the ones I extracted there. Then I specify that I have two loci. So that mutation rate is a vector of length two. So loci equals two here. And then mutation rate specifies here uh, what the mutation rate is for locus 1 and what it is for locus 2. If we look at the right hand side, the figure here, again, the plotting functionality here is external to Milan, but the black line shows that no mutation has, has, has happened, and the orange line with a cross on it shows that a mutation happened. So, for example, here the haplotype 0.0. .0 mutated to minus one uh, point minus uh, point zero sorry so one mutation happened um, again uh, the mutation rate here is fairly high so there is a uh, fairly few matches in the final uh, generation there's a high variability in the haplotypes here the alleles are centered around zero just for illustrate illustrative purposes uh, of course you would uh, in, in, in uh, general take uh, more realistic alleles so this function, pedigree all popular haplotypes, uh, what it does is to give the founder's haplotype 0, 0, uh, and then continue downwards. But there are uh, other possibilities. For example, you can also give uh, a custom founder's haplotype, and that could, for example, be drawing from a database, or you can generate a random haplotype. There's also another functionality that you can give a bounded ladder. So the default is that the, the ladder is unbounded, but we can also specify some bounds if you want to. <clears throat> we then continue now to show how to select a random male from the final generation. So Q is our curate individual, so our person of interest. And first we, <clears throat> we again look in this simulation result and we pick another slot so that slot is called the end generation individuals, and that's the final generation. So that slot contains all the individuals in the final generation here. And we take a random one of those, 
So we pick a random number between one and the, in this case, 10. And then we extract, say that this is our individual. So we go down and subset index number three here, no index and they, the random index we subset here. And we get the, the PID, so the person ID of the Q. And in this case, it's three. And we plot that as a pink uh, square over here. So if you go backwards a few slides, you would be able to see that that has PID three here. We also extract the haplotype. So that's get haplotype from Q. And in this case, it's minus one comma minus three. We can now <clears throat> look up in the population and see how many males that matches Q in the final generation. And we do that with the function called haplotype matches individuals. And we and the indiv individuals we consider that may match or may not match is the individuals in the final generation. And we want to look up this haplotype. <clears throat> so the length of the matching individuals here is three. And we can get the PIDs of these individuals. So we see that that's PID three, four, and five. And three is Q himself, but that's by convention we, we decided on including Q himself also, but that's that's uh, that's up to you how you want to, to, to do it, but that's the convention we, we went along with. Except for Q, there are two other males that has the same profile as Q. And in this case, it is his two brothers, his two paternal brothers here. You also note that Q's father and actually grandfather also match. But here we decided to only consider the final generation. And later we will demonstrate how to include the final three generations. So what we refer to as the live population. We are also interested sometimes in measuring how closely related the matching males are. So we do that by measure the relatedness by meiotic distance. So the number of father son steps. So <clears throat> this S apply takes for each entry in this matching individuals here calls the meiotic distance with that individual in Q. So this call here actually corresponds to the three calls above. So we take the meiotic distance between the first matching in Q, the second matching in Q and third matching in Q. And as you see here, the results are zero, two and two. And the zero means that they actually we have the same individuals. And between the other two matches, we can see that they are indeed the brothers. So we go up one to the father, that's one step, and then downwards one step, that's a distance of two. We can also consider, <clears throat> so when you go between Q and the other matching individuals, do all the individuals on this path, do they have the same haplotype as Q or did mutation happen? We call this max L1, so that's a maximum haplotype distance between Q and the males on the path between Q and the matching individuals X. Specifically, max L1 equals zero means that no mutations happens. It means that all the individuals on the path between Q and X has the same haplotype. <clears throat> and we can extract these uh, max L1 distances with this function name here. And we get the three matches from before. And we see that all these matches uh, has a max L1 of zero, meaning that all the individuals on the path, here's only the father, he has the same haplotype. So we get a max L1 of zero, no mutation happened between the matching males in this case. So that was a really brief example and short demonstrating the, the basic functionality of Milan. And now I want to make a more realistic uh, simulation so that means that we need to increase the population size significantly. We also want to introduce population growth. We will increase the number of loci and also use realistic mutation rates. In this case, we'll use maximum likelihood estimates of the mutation rates. But as David explained in talk number one, you would normally consider drawing from, for example, a Bayesian posterior instead. We will also use what we refer to as the live population. So that's the final three generations instead of just the last one consequences of these choices above is that we no longer illustrate the pedigrees. They're simply too large. Uh, <clears throat> in this example, we only simulate one population and only one haplotype process. In practice, you will repeat that multiple times and you will also um, 
sampled posterior uh, mutation rates multiple times. The following example takes approximately 30 minutes computation time. And please be aware that the progress bar unfortunately are unreliable, so please do not worry if they do not update during uh, the computation. <clears throat> so in this example, I chose 250 generations uh, per generation growth of 2%, and the life population size of approximately three times 100,000 uh, individuals. So I specify that with these parameters, so the Mutation or the growth is 1.02, so the generation, the next generation is 102% uh, of the current generation, the size. I specify that I want 250 generations, and I specify that the population size of the gth generation should be 100,000. And then I calculate backwards to see what the initial population size then must be. And then I calculate the population sizes for all the generations. And I round it because population size needs to be integers. And I just verify here that I indeed have 250 uh, generations. And I calculate the size of my life, life population. So in this case, it, it's 300,039 individuals. Now we need to, uh, <coughs> to call a function where we are able to vary the size of the generations. And we here provide a vector with the pop sizes. That's the vector I created over here. So that has length 200, 250. So the software knows that we need 250 generations. And then we specify two parameters here. So generations underscore full means that uh, we want the last three generations to simulate all individuals. So before I said that individuals without a descendant in the final generations were not included. And here I actually want to include, for example, a grandfather of uh, an individual that does not have any children in the final or second to final generation. And I specify that with this argument here. I also specify here that I want to be able to access uh, the individuals of the last three generations. And I'll show you briefly where that, uh, what, how I do that. Just like before, I chose a VRS value of 0.2 with these parameters. And again, I on the previous slide, I linked to a blog post describing how these parameters are connected, these fives, how that result in a BRS of 0.2. Again, I extract the pedigrees. And then I <coughs> load in the tidyverse package, and that's a package for data wrangling and plotting functionality, and I do that with library tidyverse. And just like with Milan, if you do not have that installed, you first need to install that once. So that's install.package and then quote tidyverse. And then you can uh, put in library afterwards. For the mutation rates, we here consider the Y filer plus with 27 loci, and that has an overall mutation rate of approximately 13%. And in the Milan package, we include two datasets, YSTR kits and YSTR markers. <clears throat> so the kits contain information of what, what markers are in what kits, and the YSTR marker, markers contains information for each marker, how many mutations were observed and how many meiosis were observed, and thereby we can estimate in the mutation rate. So first I take my kit and I filter uh, only by having Wi Fi Plus Kit. So I get all the markers that are contained in the Wi Fi Plus Kit here. And then I join these markers with the information for each marker about the mutation rates. Um, oh, yeah, number of meiosis and number of mutations observed in these meiosis. <coughs> and I join these or merge these by the marker column. And then I consider the maximum likelihood estimates of the mutation rates. And I do that <coughs> by accessing this mute mood pop uh, column. So that's mutation probability, and that's a maximum likelihood estimate. <coughs> and if I just consider the first four uh, digits of that, I get all these 27 mutation probabilities. <coughs> when we say that the mutation rate is 13% approximately, what we then mean is that <coughs> this vector here contains 27 mutation rates for the low side. And so if they so that's the probability of mutation and one minus that vector is the probability of no mutation. 
when we multiply them together, we say that neither of the 27 markers can mutate. So we want no mutation on all 27 loci, and then we take the uh, inverse of that, um, meaning that we have at least one mutation, maybe two, maybe three, but we, we at least have one mutation, and that is what we then get these 13 and a half percent. So that's the overall mutation rate of um, one or more mutations in a y filer plus uh, profile. Again, we just uh, give the founder's haplotype all zeros. And as I mentioned before, it can also be random or drawn from a database instead. And we actually do that in our 2019 publication and investigate what impact that has. And it turns out that it's not really that important at least for the examples we uh, we have considered for these kits. We then populate the haplotypes, just as before. So now our population is, is simulated. <clears throat> now we draw 1,000 random cues, person of interest, and calculate the number of matches. So we first access the live population. <clears throat> so that's our simulation result, and now we take the slot individuals underscore generations. So that was the other parameters I mentioned before that I set to three to be able to have all the live uh, individuals in that slot here. Previously in the examples, I only used a slot for the final generation, but now I need not just the final generation, but the final three generations. And the way I do that is to specify that when I call the function, and then I can access uh, the individuals in this way. Here I specify that I want a thousand queues, and then I, <coughs> do this, this inner function call here. I do that a thousand times, one for each of the number of suspects. So just as before, I sample a random individual between one and the number of individuals in the live population, and that's 300,039, I think. We take one number for that. We get Q, so that's the individual uh, here, and we take the haplotype of Q, and then we, just as before, count the number of haplotype uh, occurrences in the live population that matches this HQ. And then we actually get the number of matches, matches in the live population. Here I also want to calculate the number of matching uh, males in the same pedigree as Q only. So <clears throat> we do that by extracting the pedigree from the individual Q, and then count the number of hap haplotype matches within that pedigree here. And here there's sort of a technicality that we want to specify that we do not want all the matches in the pedigree, we only want the matches in, uh, in the final, second to final, and, um, and third last generation, so the, our live population. And then I save the result for suspect number i, the number of matching, and number of matching within the pedigree only, and then I bind them together to a data frame. So this data frame here now contains a thousand rows. <clears throat> and one of the questions I have is whether all the matching of the males happen within the same pedigree or whether they happen far away. So <clears throat> this vector, this column here matching, that is actually a vector of a thousand numbers. And I compare these element wise with the number of matching uh, within the pedigree. And if all these are equal, and if they are, meaning that all the matching individuals for each of the thousand individuals, actually all of them happened within the same pedigree SQ. <clears throat> we can consider this data frame, uh, and here I just take the matching and matching within pedigree and get the first six rows. And again, this is a data frame with a thousand rows. <clears throat> what I then, for example, do here is to extract the number of matching. Uh, so now M is a vector of length thousand, and I uh, calculate the median and also the 95% quartile. So these numbers resemble what we presented in talk number one and in our 2017 publication. What we did in these, uh, for these um, simulations, we just repeated them multiple times, just like I explained a few slides ago. And then we also plot the distribution of M. <laughs> and we see here that the median is here around nine, 10, and the 95% quartile is out here around 40. And again, it's a bit jacked, uh, and that would be that would be a, a bit more smooth if, if uh, the simulations were repeated multiple, multiple times. 
<clears throat> so now I want to discuss partial profiles, what we do in that case. And it's, uh, it's fairly straightforward in the sense that we actually do exactly the same thing. So we again perform simulations in the same way, but we omit the unobserved loci. And I have a small example here where we imagine that the unobserved loci uh, are 518, 627, and 385 A and B. So there are four unobserved loci because we consider this A and B as two individual loci. We then <coughs> take our uh, uh, data frame from before with the Y filer plus kit where all the markers had their mutation rates in it. And then we take the markers that are not in this vector. So this uh, excl exclamation mark in R means not. So we take all markers but these and then we extract the mutation rate and we then calculate the mutation rate for this partial profile and that's 10 and a half percent and we can again compare it to the one with the full uh, y filer plus kit that was 13 and a half percent so the mutation rate has gone down a bit so this was talk number two out of five uh, in a series of uh, webinars about uh, why uh, why kits in forensic uh, genetics the other four ones are given here. And again, we recommend that the Y webinar number one is, uh, is viewed first, and then either of the other fours can be seen afterwards in any uh, order. <clears throat>